Hello. Today I'd like to talk about Holy Jesus Hospital. This site at the centre of Newcastle upon Tyne in the northeast of England has a 700 year history and throughout that time it has served many different functions. Today we're going to be looking at some of those functions and examining how those functions have interacted with the local community. The first recorded use of the site is as an Augustinian friary. In 1291 a man called William Barron of Walk Upon Tweed donated the land that he owned in Newcastle to the Augustinian order. He wasn't actually a Baron incidentally, he was just called Baron, his surname was Baron. Now the only remains of the friary that the Augustinians built that can be seen today above ground is, are actually indicated by the red arrow. This little stub of a wall once formed what was the sacristy for the friary church. Now the Augustinians followed the ideals of St. Augustine of Hippo. They believed that interaction with the community was the divine calling. Rather than, for example, a Cistercian who likes to be removed from society in order to seek God, the Augustinians believed, and still do believe, that the way to God was through serving the people around you. Your typical Augustinian friar had the appearance of a shaved head, so very much the Robin Hood stereotype of Friar Tuck. Now, the, the Augustinians were the perfect people to call into Newcastle at this time. Newcastle at the, uh, this time had a population of 4,000 people, and for those 4,000 people, there were only four churches. Now, that's a maximum of maybe 11 clergymen and, tra and training priests. Given that priests, lay, uh, uh, monks, and friars at the time served a myriad of functions, there simply weren't enough to go around. Eleven or twelve or four thousand was too much of a deficit. After all, clergymen at the time served as uh, scholars. They could teach you to read and write if you could afford their services. They were medical men. They looked after your physical body. But also as well, obviously, they were spiritual guides and they looked after your spiritual health too. So the Augustinians were invited in to look after and start to take on the, the, the weight of people in Newcastle. And they did such a good job at this, actually, that they were given extra land by the king, although it was excessive royal uh, throughout time, actually, most notably to build a cemetery. Unfortunately, local people started to dump their rubbish on the site at one point in history, and this actually was very fortuitous for us, because it highlights something about their relationship with London. The Augustinians saw their cemetery filling up with rubbish and they called upon King Richard II actually to issue a, a, a law and some bailiffs to come and stop local people dumping rubbish on the site and he did he stepped in on their behalf so even though now all we can see is this little wall in the yard outside Holy Jesus Hospital this site was once very important and had a relationship with royalty this relationship actually continued in a fruitful capacity right up until 1539 with the dissolution of the monasteries under King Henry VIII. Indeed, Henry VIII's own sister, Margaret, stayed on this site on her way to be married in Scotland. She didn't stay in the castle, she stayed at this friary. So, clearly, the Augustinian friary was important and for a long time was in good standing with the royalty of Britain. With 1539 and the dissolution of the monasteries, however, this relationship came to an end. The twelve friars who were on the site were asked to move on, and they did, quite happily. Obviously, they weren't going to fight their friars. And um, Thomas Cromwell, actually, a, a senior member of uh, Henry VIII's government, insisted that buildings on the site be kept in some state of repair in order to be used as a, an alternative seat for the Council of the North. Now, usually, the Council of the North met in this building, King's Manor in York. It now serves as the Ar York University Archaeology Department, but for a long time it served as a base of operations for the provincial government known as the Council of the North. The only element of the site uh, uh, at Holy Jesus Hospital from this period is actually the tower, the Austin Tower so-called, because it was built on the site of the Austin Orders Friary, or the Augustinians Friary. And actually this was part of an expansion of the town at this time and the defences around Newcastle. So this once encircled the town. Now, the council did not enjoy coming to Newcastle for their meetings. 
they much, perf much rather prefer, uh, prefer to meet in York or perhaps London. However, Queen Elizabeth I um, was so scared of the Scottish threat, and specifically here's a very scary Scotsman for you, um, that she actually insisted that the council meet at least 20 days per year on this site. So they're closer to the threat of Scottish reavers and Scottish raiders, and they could actually enforce uh, the council's will close to the border. The tower actually was constructed primarily to store ordnance and uh, explosives to fight the Scottish threat. However, later on during this period it also became a miscreant jail. If you drank too much or if you owed people money, you could be thrown in this jail for a short amount of time until you mended your ways. The Council of the North continued to fight um, Scots and plan campaigns against the Scots right up until 1603 with the Union of the Crowns under James I of England. Scotland and England now technically were no longer at war. They, they had one king and with this, this uh, new order the site had to take on a new role and James I actually changed the site from being a place of a council of war to being a residential place somewhere where someone lived and quite appropriately he asked George Home to set up home in 1605 on the site. The buildings on the site actually maintained, uh, were maintained by his family and carried on in his family right up until 1646. At this time they passed into the ownership of the Corporation of Newcastle, or what is now called Newcastle City Council. Some time later, around about 1680, the Freeman Hospital was conceived this was actually the brainchild of a then mayor of the city, Mayor Oldman Fenwick, and his good friend Thomas Lewin, who actually went on to become the first master of the hospital in 1682-1683. The idea of this building was to provide a last vestige of dignity to any person who was, had reached a certain standard in society and who fell upon hard times. So if you're a freeman, often this involved having a business, incidentally, and you may perhaps you had retired and a bad debt had come towards you and you, someone hadn't paid you back and you needed somewhere to live desperately, this hospital could provide you with somewhere uh, which was just short of having to go out and beg on the streets. The plaque on the front of the building, written, written in later medieval Latin, explains its, its purpose and the reason why, um, and in fact the very notion of charity uh, being the greatest of virtues, it says at the bottom, um, the reason why this building had been put in place was to fulfil a charitable uh, goal and actually to help the frame of the city. Incidentally as well actually this building was also built in eye line uh, of the then mayor's house, Alderman Fenwick's house, can still be seen on Pilgrim Street and were it not for the um, 55 degrees north building you'd actually be able to see straight down to the hospital so it was also a bit of, bit of a pet project as far as we can tell. Here we can see a map a uh, contemporary map of the uh, of Holy Jesus Hospital in the area. You can see Pilgrim Street on the left hand side there and on the right in the middle you can see um, to the right of the street that is in the middle you can see Holy Jesus Hospital in place. This is the triangle, triangular lawn just to the, uh, to, the, to the lower portion of the map there and the long thin cigar shape of Holy Jesus Hospital a very distinctive building. Now if you did come to this hospital and you were ill, um, it was unlikely that you'd actually be cured of your illness. It was not conceived um, that illness was, was any person's responsibility to cure. God was the divine physician at this time. And if you had an illness and you did come to this hospital and you were living here, um, the most you could actually expect would be herbal remedies essentially, or uh, prayer. But we'll come back to that in a moment. For the most part, the hospital actually wasn't a hospital as we would understand it. Its root, the word, is really in hospitality. And when you came to live here, as long as you abided by the rules, you could expect hospitality. So when you were living in the hospital, assuming you passed your interview and you're a freeman of the city, you um, had to abide by the rules of the, of the house. And the rules were something along these lines. You weren't allowed overnight guests. There was a curfew every night at 9 p.m. and the door, your door, wasn't opened again until 6 a.m. the next morning. 
No drunkenness was tolerated. Church attendance was compulsory. And you had to act in a general way befitting a freeman of the city, or rather town, of Newcastle. The building actually also uh, has interesting architectural elements um, which really highlight its use as a freeman's um, resting place and lodge. This element here is actually a, a seahorse statue, and there's a, another element a little bit further up the staircase, a lion, which have come from um, ships. The whole staircase, in fact, is reclaimed ship timbers. Many of the residents of the hospital were shipwrights, and they'd been, they'd been gained a place in this building because of the connections with shipwrighting guilds and that kind of thing. So by donating to the hospital, you could actually try and ease your way later on in life if you needed them uh, into, into the staying at the building. If you look very closely, you can also see on the post, just below the seahorse, a little charity box which has been nailed there, so people can drop off money if they, if they so desire. In addition to all of this, you also gained a purple poncho, or gown essentially, much like the Chelsea pensioners. This ensured that when you were out and about, people in the city and in the town knew that you were from Holy Jesus Hospital, and if they wanted to, they may even donate money to the hospital. So this is the type of, of um, care that you could receive if you were ill at the time. This is a cleansing lotion from 1746, and notice it's little more than a herbal remedy. Hospitals, so-called at this time, were spending vast sums of money on these types of cures, anything up to a quarter of a million pounds a year. And um, even though they are uh, very effective, they're by no means intended to intervene in the course of your illness. They simply ease your pain. Notice as well that it has a wonderful uh, text to it. That the sense of of, uh, of care with which it has been written is palpable. So people took great care in how they were caring for, for the ill. But it, this was not a hospital. It's important to stress that. This was a place of hospitality. Eventually, in 1937, Holy Jesus Hospital was essentially abandoned. This was because the area had become increasingly um, active in terms of industry. Uh, there was a chemical works towards the latest part of this time, and also as well a brasserie. We'll come to that in a moment. But it made the environment untenable. So the people moved to a new spot in Newcastle called Spittle Tongues, which actually is an abbreviation of Hospital Tongues. They built their new hospital, a series of bungalows this time, instead of one long building. And um, on the 8th of October 1937, they moved in with great pomp and ceremony. And now, instead of a purple gown, you get a lovely suit. Unfortunately, though, not purple. 